All right, guys, we'll begin. So I'm just going to introduce our company. So this webinar is brought to you by English Book Education. Um, uh, English Book Education is divided up into eight pillars. Um, and the pillars include things like um, getting qualifications, like TEFL tests. Uh, we offer professional uh, teachers development. We have Unique Learning, which is our English language school in Barke. Uh, and we have Kings and Queens Club, which is the part of the company that I'm, I'm working with. I am their native speaker. Now, King, the Kings and Queens Club has book club. And to become a member of book club is to be a member of a national book club. We operate in over 40 different schools, giving out free books. And what we do is with these schools is we meet up with them once a month. Um, and they will have read the title, a book that we have given them. And um, we will discuss the book. We'll discuss the themes, the characters, the historical context behind the book. Um, and sort of the implications of the book as well. And we usually get students to uh, prepare a presentation on the book because we think it's a really good way to develop their communication skills, uh, which we think is an invaluable skill. So today's quite strange because what we're doing, um, we're not actually analyzing the book per se. It's almost like we're looking at the skeleton of a book, how a book is created, how a story is created more specifically. Now, of course, I'm not an author, I'm not a writer, I've never actually attempted to write a book, but um, I've collected some information from various authors. And um, the specific person I, I quite liked listening to was John Furfett, who, who is an um, author himself. So a lot of this is, it's a lot of his ideas, so perhaps after this session I can link you some of his talks and some of the books that he's written. Um, now, on our agenda today, we're going to begin by speaking about key principles. There are certain principles you should go in with before you write a book. Um, and principles are not quite the same as characters, narrative and theme. Principles are more like the philosophy behind how to write a book, if you like. And um, I think this might be a place where we'll have some disagreement because different authors have different principles. Next we'll talk about characters, how to write good characters, how to write likeable characters, but also characters we find interesting. Uh, we're going to talk about narrative and how there's actually different, there's a variation in narrative structure that you can write stories with different types of narrative structure and perhaps we can identify which one we prefer to write in. And you guys even have a go at thinking of a narrative structure yourself and we'll explore um, what, that spe what that specific narrative structure would look like in a book. And lastly we'll talk about themes. What should be the essence of your book? What is the point behind your book? Why have you written it? Because um, every book, a book is written for some reason, okay? Whether it be a private personal motivation or whether it be uh, written for someone else and for the reader. Okay. So I want to begin with this point um, and we're talking about principles here. Discover, don't create. Now, what I mean by that is stories should ask questions, not tell you what is what. So when you're writing the story, you shouldn't start writing about something you already know. You should, um, you should, it should be, you, as an author, you should be exploring something. You want to figure something out. And in the process of your writing this story, it is, it is you trying to come to an understanding of something. Okay. If you already know what the book's about, if the book doesn't raise any questions or make you ask questions, then it's not a story. Then it's essentially propaganda, okay? Because then you're giving out dogmatic ideas to the reader, which you're expecting them to believe. There's no room for thought when you do that. So for example, an example of this would be the Communist Manifesto, right? That's not asking questions. 
It's a manifesto. It's telling you rules. It's giving you principles. It's giving you ideas. Whereas a novel, especially, and I'm going to use this example a lot today, Crime and Punishment by Dostoevsky, it makes you ask lots of questions. And it, and it leaves you unsure until the end. So just to give you an idea of what Crime and Punishment is about, first of all, it's in the title. And the key idea behind Crime and Punishment that every crime, no matter what crime you commit, it will always have consequences. And it's not necessarily that the consequences will be going to jail, because sometimes you won't get caught. But the idea is that even if you don't go to jail, um, the crime will be a burden on your mind. You'll be psychologically punished for any crime that you commit. Now, the reason it's not propagandistic, this story, is because it simply tells a story and it leaves it up to you to, to, to sort of figure out if you agree with what the character in the story does. So what happens in the story? You have Raskolnikov, who is a, a, a young man living in St. Petersburg, around in the sort of, I believe, at the end of the uh, 19th century, somewhere in the 1800s. And He's incredibly poor. His family's incredibly poor. He has no money, but he's a good person. And he's never done a bad thing in his life. But um, there's a pawnbroker, an old lady, and she's a very horrible lady, very uh, unpleasant lady. Um, and she has a mentally um, disabled cousin who she essentially treats as her slave and is incredibly nasty to you. Now, this woman is a miserable wretch. Uh, she doesn't make anyone else's life any better. Whenever people take things to her, she always charges them an incredibly high interest. So essentially a very bitter, unpleasant, unloving woman who doesn't contribute anything to society. Now, this is what Raskolnikov thinks to himself. He thinks to himself, why don't I go and steal her money? This woman is selfish. She's never cared for anyone in her life and she doesn't need all that money. She lives by herself and she's essentially hoarding all this money. So why don't I go steal that money and then give it to the people who need it the most, i.e. my family and myself? who are poor and mis who live a terrible life, okay? But we're good people at the same time. So he, he does this, he goes to the pawnbroker, he waits for her to leave the house, he goes and he starts, he sneaks into the house and he starts taking things from the, um, from the shelves, from the drawers, taking money, taking jewelry, when, what do you know, the pawnbroker arrives at the house. Not knowing what to do, Raskolnikov essentially murders her. He swings an, a nearby axe, killing her. And to make matters worse, then the cousin comes in, the mentally handicapped cousin. And once again, out of panic, and now that there's a witness to his crime, he swings the axe again and she is killed also. And what this book deals with, it deals with, did Raskolnikov do the right thing? Or was he justified? And it constantly asks questions. What are the implications of his crime? How do you overcome a crime like that? How do you find meaning in life? How do you uh, create good relationships with family members who you've been estranged from? It asks lots of questions. Now, uh, I hope I haven't upset you because I've ruined potentially one of the greatest novels ever written. But this is the beginning of the story. And, um, and that's how it starts. And then everything afterwards follows. So I really recommend you read this story. Anyway, let me just shut the door a moment.
All right. So know your message. Know what you're trying to say, but also ask questions. And in the case of crime and punishment, it's not so much that he knows what he wants to say, uh, Dostoevsky. He knows what he wants to explore, and it is specifically this notion of crime and punishment and all the things that um, revolve around those two key words. So again, it should be art, not politics, okay? And the difference between art and politics is that art is discovery. You don't create art. Art is inspired from the world around you, from other authors, paintings, but mainly the universe. So th that's my understanding of art. You might disagree. It comes from the external world. It comes from human experience. Whereas political statements, ideologies, they don't come from the external world. They come from uh, your mind. They're constructions. They originate from you. And that's the difference. So it's kind of like um, if you write a story, but you make it political, you're basically putting a, a, a layer of construction on top of the of, on top of the narrative. So um, and I think a really good example of that and a book I, I don't particularly like, maybe you guys do like it, but I, I, I particularly detest this book is um the hand the handmaid's tale handmaid's tale and that's an example for me of an overtly political book and it's all based on the idea that we live in an oppressive patriarchal society okay you can't separate the politics from the story there it's overt and uh, i just find it too jarring i feel like that book doesn't ask any questions it just tells you that that is the state of society or the potential place it could go. Okay, um, do we have any questions or anything we want to say um, about that? What do we think? Should, 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 your, should stories be political or should they be free of politics? Should they be ideological or should they be free of ideology? What do we think? When you write your story, Will you try and tell the reader what they should think? Or will you try and get them to start questioning things? That's a key decision that you need to make. Yeah. Guys, if you have any questions or want to say anything, I recommend you put it into the group chat and I'll keep an eye on the group chat and I'll answer any questions or ideas have. In my opinion, I wouldn't write about politics. Sure. It's almost like you shouldn't know, you shouldn't have an understanding of what you're going to write about. When you're writing, in the process of writing, it should be you trying to figure things out. And when you read Crime and Punishment, it, that's very much the impression you get, that this is an author who's trying to figure something out as he's writing. He's trying to figure out questions about morality and religion, about crime and punishment. Okay, all right, let's move this on. Now, the other thing is you should create characters that you love, characters that you want to root for essentially, because then the story will write itself. So in the example of Huckleberry Fitz, there's lots of examples of this. Characters who have very, very significant faults, faults that are very dislikable, but are made up for by other personality traits that they have. So in the example of Huckleberry, Huckleberry Finn, Huckleberry Finn is an incredibly irresponsible uh, young boy, doesn't go to school, he does whatever he wants, um, and like I said, he's irresponsible and quite lazy as well to some degree. But what makes him really likable, the reason we don't get annoyed by his irresponsibility is because we fall in love with his wit, with his intelligence, his ability to think quickly on his feet, but also the fact that he's um, very um, loyal, okay? You've got to balance your characters out. You've got, I mean, you've also got to make them realistic. You've got to make sure that they have faults, because no one's perfect, you've got to make sure that they have this multi-dimensional character 
but you've got to make, give them certain characteristics that makes you want to read about them, that makes you want to connect with them, that makes you want to root for them. So a similar example, I suppose, um, I mean, this happens all the time in books. Like I said, with crime and punishment, it's all from the perspective of someone who murders um, two women in cold blood. But I can assure you, when you read that book, you'll really like Raskolnikov as a character. He's a very intelligent young man, a man who really cares about his family, and you feel sorry for him because we see the world through his perspective. Thinking of it now, it is quite amazing that despite that first part of the book where he murders two people, you continue to read the story and you still really like the guy and you root for him as well. Even when he's sort of hiding from the police and trying to cover up what he's done, you actually root for him. That's the bizarre thing about this book. You actually, <laughs> you actually don't want him to get caught. So create characters that you love and you want to love, not characters that you essentially detest and don't want to read about anymore. I'm kind of like that about, well, I'm trying to think of a character that I just find completely unappealing, but I can't at the moment. Can you guys think of some characters that you love, characters that you love from books, and what it is that you love about them? What, char what, what are your favorite characters from a book? Mine's probably Raskolnikov from Crime and Punishment. Another really great character that you wouldn't expect to like is if you've read Bulgakov's um, The Master and Margarita, the character of Woland, who is essentially Satan, he's literally the devil, but he's written in such a way that you just find him incredibly charming as well, almost. There's a lot of these characters, like even the Joker, if we think about the phenomenon surrounding the Joker and the current Joker movie, that film is about a very, very um, mentally deranged man who's been abused by society and basically wants to have vengeance on society. But people are obsessed with the Joker. We actually love the character of the Joker and it's a weird word to use that we love him, but we certainly do like him. Anyway, so during this presentation, if you can think of any characters that you love, I really would like to know who are, who are some of the characters that you love from literature. The artist from the picture of Dorian Gray, absolutely. And specifically, what sort of, um, uh, what is it about the artist that you love? Like, well, what, what, um, what, what is there about his character that makes you love him? Another one is um, a really popular one is also, um, I know I keep listing films, but also Captain Jack Sparrow comes to mind. A pirate who steals and murders people, steals things and murders people, but we, again, we like him because he's funny, he's witty, and he's got certain characteristics that we can really respect. Anyway. Now the other thing about characters, it's, yes, you've got your character, you've got your character's personality, but you should also try and force characters into situations you wouldn't want to be in yourself. Why, why do you think that might be a useful thing to do? To force your character into situations that you as the author would not like to be in. That you would find uncomfortable. That the reader would feel uncomfortable reading. I... That's a, that seems to be a Georgian book, but I, I don't know. I don't know that book. I'll, perhaps I'll check it out later. So you know the character better, yes. Um, I suppose you get to know the character better when you get to um, get to see how they are in their most vulnerable state and how they would behave in certain, yes, and how they would behave in certain situations. We can't really truly get to know a character if we can't see um, how they behave in the most extreme circumstances. It's often the most extreme circumstances like, like Raskolnikov circumstance that can really explain to us the nature of a character. They might commit a sacrifice, they might self-sacrifice, or they might commit a murder. 
Okay. So in this case, despite Raskolnikov being a good guy with a loving family, when he's most desperate, his, it's his desperation that causes him to murder someone. Joanne from Triumphal Arc. I haven't heard of that one. Perhaps you could tell me um, what you like about that character. That's also something I'd like to know is what is it about these characters that you love? Also, when you put characters into situations you would least like to be in, it makes the writing process way more intense. You're literally channeling your inner fear as, as a writer. And so when the re the reader reads it, um, it immerses them more into the story. They they actually feel that fear. Okay, they feel almost trapped inside the story, and that's a. And if you can do that as an author, that's amazing. If you have the ability to literally trap your reader in the story, to write something that basically makes them want to look away. If you can get the reader's senses 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 like um how they feel inside and that if you can get them physically um involved then you definitely achieved something as a writer what's my favorite book um if you probably gathered it's it is um crime and punishment and that's why i'm using this book it's crime and punishment by dostoevsky and um Master and Margarita is probably a very close second. Uh, yeah. And maybe Persuasion by Jane Austen, but that's completely different. Okay. Anything else we want to say about characters? She is very unidentified. Jane Austen? Yeah, I suppose. What do you mean unidentified? What do you mean by unidentified? Oh, I see. She's. You're talking about Jean from Triumphal Arc. Okay. All righty. Now the other thing you've got to think about. You've got to think about your story as a whole. Um. You've got to think about your story as a whole, and you've got to. And your story needs to have a certain structure. Okay. And you have two options. Either you decide the structure beforehand. Or you write the story and then you sort of rearrange the story to match the structure that you want. But this isn't typically that difficult because stories have an inevitable way of forming these sort of universal structures. And it's usually the three act structure um, or the, just the general structure where you have um, an ascension of um, tension, like the tension is growing. Um, until it peaks and you have a climax and then there's a dissension as we come to the conclusion of the story and you know this is typically uh, shown in something like the hero's journey which is the archetypal story that or, that many many stories and narratives have and it's the idea that you have a main character who um, essentially goes on an adventure or goes on uh, and like an adventure can be metaphorical, but essentially uh, this character ends up in a situation where they have to learn something new. They potentially have to overcome something. Um, like I said before, char put your characters into uncomfortable situations. Perhaps they have to overcome something. Um, they overcome it. And the overcoming, the specific moment in which they overcome might be the climax. And then you have them, the dissension is them uh, returning home. Again, metaphorically, whatever that means, but returning to uh, the initial state that they were in at the beginning of the story, but changed. Okay. You've got to have, and just like with narrative structure, you should have a character arc as well. What is your character like at the beginning of the story? And wh what do they become at the end? Okay. So, can you can you think of um, other stories that have this narrative structure? Like, can you think of an example of a story that has this sort of narrative structure? You have three parts. As you can see, you've got the initial incident, then you've got obstacles, 
and then you've got dissension. Call me by your name. Call me by your name. Which one is that? Who plays in Call Me By Your Name? You just see, Call Me By Your Name. That really rings a bell. Ah, yes, this is a new one. I haven't seen it. The inc that's an incredible book about two boys. Yeah, I, I sort of have a rough idea of what it's about. Okay, and there's a and there's a climax in that day as well. It's really good. Okay, I'll I'll check it out. The Hobbit, absolutely, one hundred percent, one hundred percent. He goes on an adventure. He slays the dragon. It's 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 such an archetypal story. It is literally the hero's journey. He leaves his home as a naive hobbit. He there's a call to adventure. Then they defeat the dragon they defeat uh, various other things and then he returns home he returns to where he started but he returns as a um, as a changed as a changed person perhaps a hero someone who has learned something about the world okay and you know like even tarantino has a structure as well in his films but he does it in a really, really extreme way. Spider-Man as well, 100%. But um, Tarantino films, it's like building up tension, building up tension. And then the climax, he just, the climax will always be completely over the top. Destruction, fire, violence, everyone's killing each other. <laughs> and, then, and then it's such a high climax that the dissension is almost... Like it's really satisfying coming down from a Tarantino climax. They're very, very intense. Um, if you ever get the chance, I recommend watching Inglorious Bastards. Um, <laughs> I mean, every Tarantino film, he just goes completely nuts. I think there's something slightly wrong with that man, but he makes amazing films. But yeah. So, um, I mean, I don't know, uh, what I'm curious to ask, do you guys think that perhaps there's an, there are some different ways of structuring a narrative? Could you think of a different way of doing this? Because it's almost hard to imagine to do it any other way. Could you think of another one? Another way of uh, structuring a narrative? How else might you do it? Because like below, I've got another example. And you've got almost multiple different climaxes, but each climax gets more intense than the next. I suppose Doste, the, the Prime and Punishment, it's almost the other way round. It's almost the other way round because you've got actually the climax at the beginning of the story with the murder. And it's that's probably the most climatic thing that happens in the book. OK, and then I suppose from there you've got a dissension. But it's. You have a dissension, but it's not, you have a dissension, but with certain peaks. But yeah, it's almost like the other way around. I don't know, perhaps when you read that book, you might disagree with that interpretation of the narrative structure. But for me, it's almost like, yeah, you've got the climax at the beginning. You have something insane happening at the beginning. I mean, then you've got horror movies and horrors in general. And their narrative structure is basically, there is no, um, if you've seen a lot of horror movies, they often end in really terrible ways. So the last scene, the very last thing that happens is the main character will die because the, because the demon jumped out of a window, jumped out of a mirror or something, I don't know. Or like Final Destination, like those really um, horrific films. Um, they almost don't have a dissension. They, 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 the climax is almost at the very end, like it literally ends on the climax. And that's why I don't really like horrors, because I find that quite unsatisfying. Anyway, so if you can think of, well, not all horror movies, and yeah, not all of them. So the horror movies I like are the ones which do have some kind of resolution. Um, because if they don't have a resolution, I don't really see the point of the film other than simply to be horrifying like you can make a good horror movie that's actually asks questions and makes you think so for example the original exorcist that's a very powerful movie and it's actually about family and love 
<laughs> weirdly enough, but it's explored in an extremely extreme way. So yeah, if you can think of perhaps um, some other way of structuring a narrative, please let me know, um, because it's always interesting to explore non-traditional ways of doing things, because that can be interesting to explore. Perhaps there are some other ways we could we could um, uh, create our narratives. Okay. But also, um, the, sorry, the other thing I didn't mention is when you're writing your narrative, obviously it's one way of making perhaps the story more real, if that's what you're aiming for, if you want to make your story realistic and give uh, a sense that it is real, um, you might have like lots of subplots going on. So it's not just following the main character, you've also got other things going on on the outside. And, and um, excuse me, um, Bebby, I'm just in a um, meeting. Sorry, okay. later. So you might have multiple different subplots, and what that does, I suppose, it gives it detail um, and intricacy. And what the detail does is it sort of it makes the story more real, because obviously um, in real life, it's not like there's just your story. It's it's all intersubjective and interconnected. So there's multiple things going on. So you can do that for detail, but don't complicate things in stories. Don't be, don't make your story complicated for the sake of it. You know, let let the um, let the your natural inclinations guide you when you're writing the story. Um, try and make it as natural as possible without imposing too many sort of rules, I suppose. I mean, at the same time, your story does need to make sense. I mean, real life doesn't really make much sense, but story should make more sense than life. Uh, and what I mean by that is that the reason people read books is to is to have some control over narrative. Like the reason we have narratives, it's not just in stories. The reason we almost understand our world in terms of narrative is because it gives the world structure. Because without the notion of narrative and story, we wouldn't really understand the world we live in. So your story needs to needs to make sense, and you've got to uh, really avoid plot holes, because otherwise it's sort of the whole thing will just come crashing down, um, essentially. Now, do we have any questions at all? Do we have any questions so far? Or anything we would like to say? No. Okay. Yes. Yes, I do. Now, would you prefer old books or the new generation ones? I prefer old books. I think that new books, I don't particularly read many new books, and that might be because I'm quite cynical when it comes to literature. I sort of, I have a, I have a bit of a problem where I assume that if it's new, it's probably not going to be very good. I don't know. I mean, maybe I'm justified in that because when, when literature is dependent on demand, as in consumers, and people who buy stuff, then the quality is going to become worse because I suppose authors will be more focused on making their books profitable than um, genuine. In a way, when you write a book, I mean, obviously people are going to read it, but you shouldn't really write it for anyone else. There should be no restraint on what you write. And that's what, that's what will make it authentic. You shouldn't write it for other people. The moment you write it for other people, you're putting arbitrary constraints on your writing ability. So, um, and I feel like old authors, they didn't have that problem. They didn't have that problem when they were writing. And there was an emphasis on writing what you genuinely felt and what you were experiencing. I mean, if you look at, I mean, you've got books like Twilight. <laughs> and the Twilight's literally, okay, we've got, it's catered for teenage 
mainly teenage girls, but you know, teenage boys as well, I guess. And the key idea behind Twilight is you've got a very attractive, young pop star looking uh, vampire and a girl, and it's sort of, it's all completely directed at one, one audience. Yeah, and you sort of, it doesn't, it doesn't like go beyond that. It's just very surface. When you said that the story shouldn't have too many rules, I want to ask about Tolkien's world. It is considered complicated because he created a completely new world and does that make it less interesting? No, no, no. So, okay. Um, well, like the, the world you create still needs to make sense, especially if you're creating a new world. And I suppose what's so incredible about the Lord of the Rings is the detail makes you, it, it really does transport you somewhere else. So no, that's not an issue. I'm saying it's, I'm saying don't be complicated for the sake of being complicated. Don't create rules for the sake of creating rules. You know, sometimes people just do that so to try and come across as like, as if they're an, an intelligent author. Like there's some situations where yes, you should have rules and some situations where you shouldn't have constraints and rules. In Tolkien's case, it works because Tolkien wants to take you somewhere else. Um, that's what Tolkien's doing there. It's 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 a it's a term called um, cognitive estrangement. Cognitive estrangement. So cognitive refers to your mind, and estrangement refers to being alienated from something. Um, he's trying to make us understand our own world, but by shifting our perspective to a different one. So Tolkien's work. So Tolkien's book is actually still about this world, in every sense, but by shifting the perspective. Uh, to a different universe. One, it makes us more interested, um, and two, it shifts our perspective. And when you, whenever you shift your perspective, it can often help you understand things in a much um, better way. There's a really good book. Um, it's really weird, but it's called Under the Skin. And the idea behind Under the Skin is like, they're these aliens who have come to Earth but they've done plastic surgery to themselves, like intense plastic surgery so that they look like humans. So they've had like, it's, it's a bit gross, but they've had parts of their body cut off and stuff so they can fit into these human suits. And what they do is they essentially, they lure men into cars, hitchhikers specifically, and the main character is this alien, she's, and she's in the form of a very attractive woman. She lures hitchhikers into her car, and then she drugs them, and then she takes them to her to the mothership where they're processed for meat. So they they eat human flesh. Um, sorry if I ruined your day with that plot line because it's, it's quite a it's quite a horrible book. But anyway, interesting book. What that book is doing, it's still about people, and the alien is still actually fundamentally a human being, even though it says it's an alien. But what it's doing is we see we see through the perspective of an of an of an of a oppressed individual. But the reason why it's interesting to use an alien is because it shifts our perspective. Okay, it it almost your brain it almost tweaks your brain when when you when you do something like that. And it helps you to see um, the perspective of an, of an impressed, oppressed individual from a clearer perspective. Um, so perhaps that's another thing you can do when you're writing your story is try and bring in cognitive estrangement. That book is called um, Under the Skin. Under the Skin. Um, don't read it if you're under the age of... 16. Okay, I feel like the new generation ones mostly talk about the future and that all feel the same. Yeah, I guess a lot of, yeah, there are a lot of books, but then again, science fiction is, um, science fiction is also dealing in cognitive estrangement because it's also shifting the perspective to a slightly separate world. I don't know, I find science fiction interesting, but it's got to be a good, a good science fiction. Now, the next key principle uh, you should obey is you must refine your draft at least twice. When you write a story, when you've completed writing it, and you've read it once through, 
you absolutely need to do it again because there is no chance on this earth that you have got it right the first time. Because when you're writing, you're writing almost um, with a closed uh, perspective. You're writing each sentence page at a time and you're, write, you're looking at the intricacies. But when you read the whole book, then you can see the structure and you might realize that actually maybe that event should be over here. It'd be better if it was over here. OK, you need to then look at your book as a whole and you'll probably need to uh, rewrite it quite a few more times. It's kind of like when you write an essay, you, you almost can never write an essay first time correctly. Beta readers. Better readers are useful to like letting someone else give you some criticism. What do, what do you mean? Like having um, someone read your book and give you a different perspective, perhaps? I mean, so again, going back to the Russian authors, and this is why they're so incredible, um, is when you read any novel by a Russian author, it almost feels like every single sentence has been written at least 10 times until it was perfect, okay? The, and then every paragraph was rewritten so that the structure of the paragraph was perfect. And what that does, it just allows the story to be read so smoothly. Style matters as well. You need to be able to communicate your ideas in the most clear way possible. Again, that's another reason why you shouldn't complicate things too much. A story should flow. Like, this is why movies don't really have that problem, is a movie flows because it's imagery and it's much easier to process. But writing, you need to try and make writing almost flow the same way that a film flows. But yeah, um, N, I agree, better readers are useful too, for sure. Now finally, theme. Um, and we've probably already touched on this, but you should one of the best approaches, I suppose, is to focus in on one theme and flesh it out as much as possible. You shouldn't have multiple themes from the start. You should be like, what do I want my book to be about? And this has got to be really clear in your head. And like, so Dostoevsky, crime and punishment. And it's your starting point. And then you branch out. It's like a seed. And that's the best thing you can do. And if you can explore a theme in as much detail as possible and every aspect of a theme, that's when your book will start to look like reality because it will have that much detail and that much uh, perspective and that much consideration. There's something great when you can when you can think figure something out about a theme, like an aspect of a theme that is non-typical and something that wouldn't have occurred to you wouldn't have occurred to you before. So try and look at a theme from every single angle because then it will resemble reality more, because life is so multidimensional. Yeah. And that specific theme can mean lots of different things in lots of different um, contexts as well. Okay, guys, that's, that's the end of the presentation. Do we have any questions, anything else you'd like to explore about writing a good story or anything you'd like to say? Is there anything else you want to say before we move on to next week's topic. Anything else? Any questions, anything you'd like to say? Would you like some personal book recommendations? Perhaps you might want to recommend me some more books that I should read. And I'm trying to remember what I was recommended because I am in need of a good book. Um, what did we have? Call Me By Your Name is a film that I, I might check out. There's that Georgian book, but I, I'm a, I'm, I can't read very well in Georgian. I, I read very slowly, I read like a child almost. Um, okay. The Witcher, yeah, for sure. I mean, I might just watch the TV show. Apparently that's meant to be pretty good. Unless we're talking about something different. Love the show. Okay. I'll take your word for it.
We must talk about Kevin. That is a really good book. That's about the where they had the kids sort of got psychological problems and he's a bit of a psycho or something. Yeah. There is a game too. Should we recommend movies too? Yeah, you can recommend movies. Why not? I've read Gene Sebi's Tower, but I read it in English. Um, yeah, no, that's a, that's a really, really strong book. Really revealed to me um, some of what the situation was like over here during Soviet times. And um, yeah, it's incredibly repressed time. Baron and Luthien or the Silmarillion? Okay, interesting names. I like I like I like Luthien, Silmarillion. I like that name. If you like just yeah, I think that you should like books of Stephen King. Or, yeah, Stephen King as well. I like Stephen King. Um, I particularly like it's called I think the Tall Grass. They made a really awful film version of it, but there's um that's another good Stephen King book. I recommend the movie series Free Rain. It's amazing. Well, actually, lucky for me, I will have this group chat saved um, and I can actually go through all of these and put them on my list. So, guys, next week, I believe it will be next week. No, this is on, this is this Friday. Uh-huh. This is this Friday. I believe it's Shakespeare's birthday soon. So we've decided to do a series of Shakespeare webinars and we're going to do four of them and we're going to begin with the Tempest and we're going to look at themes in the Tempest, the story, the historical context and what the Tempest is really about. So I'd recommend if you haven't read the Tempest perhaps read a short summary it will be sufficient. It's a very strange, it's one of Shakespeare's strangest plays. It is Shakespeare's strangest play. A lot of people are kind of like, what was going on in his head when he wrote this one? Because um, it explores magic and creatures. There's the harpy or something. There's like this sort of fairy character, literal fairy. And everyone's like, yeah, this is a really odd one. What does it all mean? So um, I'm gonna try and unpack that for you on Friday. Okay guys, if you don't have any more questions, anything else you want to say, um, I wish you a good day and goodbye. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. The tiger skin. I've been told to read that as well. I, I think there are some English versions, actually. I think there was a couple from Cambridge who became obsessed with that book and they and they wrote a really good translation. I wonder if we have that on our website, actually. You're welcome, Deanna. Thank you for attending. It's my pleasure. Have a nice day, everyone. Thank you for your contributions, your ideas, your book recommendations, your film recommendations. It is a great time to be reading and watching films. That's for sure. I watched, what did I watch yesterday? American Beauty. And my friends couldn't believe I hadn't seen it before. And it makes sense because that, wow, that was a, that was a good movie. Stay safe indeed. Stay safe. Have a nice day. You're welcome, Anna. It's my, it's my pleasure. Thank you for attending. My pleasure, Nick, my pleasure.